All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first part of our lecture series here for the History Department, Spring 2021. My name is Joe Frucci. I'm an adjunct assistant professor for the History Department, uh, and I am here to be fielding the questions at the very end of this lecture. I ask that you hold your questions to the end, and then you can type them in the chat, and I will be moderating them and reading them off for our presenters to read through. If you have not already done so, for those students needing clue credit, please email me, which I just put in the chat box that you can see, with your name and Empel ID, and I will be able to uh, make sure you guys get and girls get the clue credit for that. So I'd like to pass this over now to Professor Eric Iveson to continue. Thank you, Joe. Um, a very warm welcome to you all to this, as Joe said, this first lecture in the CSI History Department's Spring 2021 lecture series. I'm Professor Eric Iverson. I teach history in the Department of History at CSI. And it's my very great pleasure to uh, introduce our two distinguished speakers today. Uh, let me say a few words about our speakers uh, before I pass over the baton to them. Uh, our speakers today are Merle Eisenberg of the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center in Annapolis, Maryland, and Lee Mordecai of the Hebrew University History Department in Jerusalem, Israel. Uh, Merle Eisenberg is a postdoctoral fellow at the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center at the University of Maryland, and is a late antique and early medieval historian. Lee Mordecai, as I said, is an assistant professor of history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, Lee is a Byzantine historian interested in social and environmental questions. In the past, he has worked on different disasters in the ancient and late antique Eastern Mediterranean, such as earthquakes and floods. Lee's methodologies are interdisciplinary and he strongly supports collaborative projects with colleagues from the humanities, archeology span and the natural sciences. Uh, Lee's current research project examines the Justinianic plague in late antiquity as well as in modern scholarly discourse. Uh, Merle uh, also works on the same related subjects. Um, he and Merle, uh, Lee and Merle have uh, indeed published uh, quite a lot together and uh, they've been especially busy uh, doing podcasts and lectures over the last year. And they have both published articles in the American Historical Review, Past and Present, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, the Journal Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies, and the Journal of Late Antiquity, among, among others. Merle is currently at work on two book projects, one on the transformation of the post-Roman West, and the second, uh, I think in collaboration with Lee, on the history of the Justinianic plague from the sixth century to the present. And intriguingly, uh, I'll have to now look this up, Merle and Lee host the podcast, Infectious Historians, uh, which sounds irresistible. <laughs> so today they're going to be talking to us uh, about a subject they know so well, and they are recognized experts on the topic. They're going to be talking to us about pandemics and catastrophe, the Justinianic plague, and the origins of the Middle Ages. So it's my pleasure to hand over uh, to our two speakers today. Thank you. So I guess you can all see this, correct? Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. So just to reiterate what Eric said, the infectious historian. So this is our logo here. Feel free to get on any podcast service. Uh, but 
Thanks, Eric, and thanks, Joe, for organizing this. And I guess we can just start off. And maybe a good place to start would be to discuss the history of pandemics during COVID as a topic that has been Quite a bit of the drawn quite a bit of attention, gained quite a bit of prominence in recent times. You can see different examples, more or less academic of, of discourse, in, mostly during the past year. Maybe the underlying question of a lot of this discourse is this piece in the center here: What a century of disease outbreaks, or what can historical pandemics teach us about COVID-19? So. We'll try to propose an answer to that question. Maybe it won't be the answer you expect, but at least we'll try. What we'll do today is we'll start with some background about plague and the plague pandemics, then move on to discuss the Justinianic plague in late antiquity, talk a bit about the maximalist approach. We'll explain what that is, a critical revision to this approach, and maybe cover some short and uh, mid long-term effects. Then we'll think about, or we'll discuss infectious diseases and modernity, so over the past roughly century and a half, and conclude with an aftermath of COVID-19, and of course, conclude the all, overall talk briefly after that. Okay, so let's start with plague. When we say plague, we usually mean bubonic plague. Bubonic plague is one of three types of plague, which I'll get to in a minute. The bubonic plague is the most common form of plague. All three types are caused by the same pathogen, the, the Yersinia pestis bacterium. In the case of the bubonic plague, it causes buboes to appear. The, these buboes, you can see them, an example of them on the slide there. The buboes appear usually in the armpits, the groin, sometimes the neck. They're really swollen lymph nodes. And again, that's the most common form of plague. The untreated bubonic plague results in between 30 and 90 percent mortality of the person. So if a person is sick with bubonic plague and that person is not treated, their chances of dying are somewhere between 30 and 90 percent. The other two types of plague also caused by Yersinia pestis, septicemic plague and pneumonic plague, they're both more lethal but also far more rare and generally are not discussed as frequently for historical pandemics, so we'll really focus on bubonic plague here. So how do you get plague? It's a good question. Plague actually exists in the wild today as well and rodent populations such as marmots or prairie dogs in the Western United States. The fleas transmit plague within different groups or communities or colonies of those populations, those animals, those species. And every once in a while, a person comes into contact, let's say with the prairie dog, someone pets a prairie dog or something, and a flea can jump from that prairie dog and infect the flea, of course, can jump from that prairie dog and infect that person, bite that person and infect them. So that would be one route. Another route would be that the prairie dog comes into contact with another animal, for example, a black rat maybe who lives in closer proximity to humans, please move from the prairie dog or marmot or, or some other rodent to the, the black rat, let's say, and then please from that black rat infected please can infect humans. In both cases, those people may develop bubonic plague. If that happens, some of the people who have bubonic plague would also develop pneumonic plague, and pneumonic plague is the only way in which people can infect each other, which is what we see on this part of the slide. There have been three plague pandemics in human history. The pandemic is an epidemic of an outbreak of disease over a large, large geographic area. There's no more concrete definition. But the three plague pandemics, the first one begins with the Justinianic plague, sixth to eighth century CE, happens around the Mediterranean and kills between 15 and 100 million deaths. Remember those numbers, we're going to talk a bit, going to criticize them a bit later a bit later. Um, then we have the second pandemic, which begins with the Black Death in the 14th century, mid 14th century, and it continues a few centuries afterwards, happens in Europe, the Middle East and beyond, killing between 75 and 200 million people. And the third pandemic uh, at the turn of the 20th century, which really extends worldwide, but its main impact. So between 90 to 95% of the 12 million people who die in the third pandemic die in India. Yeah, the Justinianic plague and the Black Death, as you can see on the bottom part of the slide, actually correspond pretty nicely. The, the, the tripartite the, the, the division of history into antiquity, the Middle Ages, and the modern period. So the Justinianic plague comes right at the end of antiquity, the beginning of the Middle Ages. The Black Death comes right at the end of the Middle Ages, beginning of the modern period. Maybe in a few centuries, we'll have some new, new period that begins with a third pandemic. Who knows? 
And okay, so that's broadly speaking that plague, and we'll move on from here to discuss the maximalist approach for the Justinianic plague. Now, the maximalist interpretation, or what we call the maximalist approach, it has been the common interpretation for plague at least until 2019, at least until two years ago. There are different voices in this debate, but broadly speaking, they tend to agree that plague had had a wide geographic scope, so extending from Scandinavia in the north to Yemen and Ethiopia in the south. Plague caused mass death, killing anywhere between 25 to 70 percent of populations around, around the Mediterranean, or between 15 and 100 million deaths. Plague had a long duration, so waves of plague or amplifications of plague, the terminology is not really important for us now, but these things last for about 200 years. So it's not a one-off event, but it's a recurring event over 200 years, again, six to eight centuries. And plague causes or has caused a massive impact. And maybe the biggest impact of them all is the fall of the Roman Empire. You can see a few examples of the connection between plague and the fall of the Roman Empire on the right side of the slide. So that's the maximalist approach. And I think maybe the best way to think about the maximalist approach is, at least for me, is this graph, which is part of a recent, uh, a recent publication that was published a few years ago in 2017. This is a model, a demographic model for the Justinian plague. What we see here on the x-axis, so between 500 and 600, this is the time over the sixth century. And then the y-axis is the population of the empire. So if we start the sixth century, the population of about 30 million in the empire, somewhere around 541, 542. There is this drop of about 50%, so from 3 million people to 15 million people. All of a sudden, in a very short period of time, 